In Egyptian mythology, it is said that the sun god Ra, in his beetle form of Kepri, rises each morning from dawn in an eternal journey of dutiful devotion to life. In his journeys over his eternal homeland of Egypt, he saw the land pass from dynasty to dynasty in an endless cycle since time immemorial. One day, as he rose, weary from his fight with the serpent Apophis, he saw the Hyksos, Egypt's foreign rulers, driven out from the land of the Nile. This was the beginning of Egypt's new kingdom, a period of unprecedented political expansion and social change. It was here that many of Egypt's most famous pharaohs reigned, and when Egypt became an imperial power. It was here that art, poetry, science and literature flourished in the fertile land the natives called Kemet, or Black Land. It was also here that Ra's disk, Aten, would supplant him, if only for a moment, in the eternal cycle of day and night. Welcome to our video on Egypt's new kingdom and its history, politics, culture, economy and religion. And once you understand ancient Egypt, rule it with the sponsor of this video, Total War Pharaoh, the ultimate Bronze Age strategy game in which Egypt plays a starring role, and they'll need your help to deal with the looming Bronze Age collapse. If you don't fancy one of the Egyptian leaders you can play as, switch to the other side, as the game features Hittite and Canaanite factions as well. All these world powers must maintain the pillars of civilization as the Bronze Age comes to an end. Defend against the oncoming attacks of the Sea Peoples, carry your civilization through disaster, and don't forget that the other civilizations can't be left to plot against you either. And you'll be involved from the highest highs of strategy and politics on the world map, down to the individual soldiers fighting for you on the ground, the epic Total War formula. With new features for the franchise like dynamic weather, armor degradation, seasonal flooding and tons of optimizations and all-round improvements, this latest Total War is the best way to see an authentic portrayal of the Bronze Age and conquer it. The game is out October 11th, so use our link in the description to pre-order or buy it right now. Before we dive into the golden age of the new kingdom of Egypt, let us first cover how it came to power. The new kingdom of Egypt usually refers to the rulers from the 18th to the 20th dynasty of Egypt, who climbed to prominence in a particularly turbulent geopolitical environment. The preceding period to the new kingdom is known as the Second Intermediate Period, which was as chaotic as the breath of Apophis. Lower Egypt, in the north of the country, was ruled by a dynasty of foreigners called the Hekau Kasut, or the Hyksos. In the south, the Kingdom of Kush ruled what is today Sudan, while to the west, in the lands of the god Set, various tribes and statelets of the ancestors of the Amazigh or Berber peoples ruled over Libya. Intermediate dynasties ruled by native Egyptians were mostly concentrated around the city of Weset, known as Thebes to the Greeks and Luxor to modern Egyptians. From this city, the last rulers of the 17th dynasty served as vassals of the Hyksos, sometimes obediently and at other times rebelling against Hyksos rule. It was from here that a brother of the last 17th dynastic pharaoh founded the 18th dynasty and led one final revolution against the foreign Hyksos overlords. His name was Amos I. We do not know the details of this revolt, but we know that he succeeded, and the new kingdom of Egypt was born through his victory. After Amos I came Amenhotep I, who continued a state-heavy economic policy of development and campaigned against Nubia. This resulted in the new kingdom annexing much of Sudan, wealthy lands whose bountiful resources enabled royal developments and grand artistic patronage while skyrocketing the political power of the victorious pharaohs. This expansionist policy was a staple of the new kingdom's rulers and their politics. Amenhotep's successor was Thutmosis I, who reigned for 12 years. As soon as he ascended to power, he crushed a rebellion in Nubia, then fought in major campaigns in Syria and Palestine, and followed up by putting down yet another rebellion in Nubia once again. His campaigns enabled Egyptian control over the Near East and its trade routes, allowing the new kingdom to build links with Assyria and the Hittites. His successor, Thutmosis II, faced the standard Nubian revolts, but we are unsure about much else of his life. 
After Thutmosis II came Thutmosis III, who was a child at the time. Due to this, the king's sister wife, Hatshepsut, ruled in his stead, later assuming pharaonic regalia and calling herself king. Her reign saw Egypt develop links with the land of Punt, thought to be modern-day Eritrea and Djibouti, through a highly planned expedition which brought frankincense and many other exotic goods back to the shores of the Nile. Hatshepsut was also an avid patron of art and architecture, and sponsored construction projects all over Egypt during her reign. Unfortunately, after her reign, the patriarchal system of ancient Egypt saw her erased from the historical record by subsequent rulers. As such, her name was scratched from all monuments where she was present. When Thutmose III came of age and took Hatshepsut's place, he initiated many military campaigns, such as the Battle of Megiddo, which paved the way for his conquest of Syria. Rule in the north seems to have come through a governor of north countries, erecting pillars as north as Lebanon. The next two pharaohs, Amenhotep II and Thutmose IV, continued their predecessor's tradition of construction and military campaigns. However, their successor, Amenhotep III, left larger ripples in the historical record. Amenhotep III was a powerful figure of the 18th dynasty, attested to in the Amarna Letters, a collection of diplomatic correspondence between Egypt and Near Eastern states found in the city of Amarna, not as a mighty conqueror, as his predecessors had been, but as a shrewd and genteel diplomat. He and his powerful wife, T, ruled in relative peace. However, their reign was not without its court of blood spilled, for it presided over the occasional military expedition into a by now Egyptianized northern Nubia. These expeditions usually resulted in the infliction of brutal punishments upon the locals, which often included widespread deportations. Despite this, Amenhotep III's reign was ultimately one defined by peace and stability. The Amarna letters mention good trade relations with the Mitanni in Asia Minor, and many scholars postulate that during this time, the new kingdom even maintained regular trade with faraway Armenia. Triumphs of architecture, such as monastic complex construction, boomed during Amenhotep III's reign, and trade continued to flourish, despite the attempts of marine freebooters, such as the dastardly Lycian pirates of Cyprus, to disrupt it. Amenhotep III also presided over an era of unprecedented religious patronage, especially of deities like Amun. Most important of all was his construction projects at Thebes, which became a city full of monuments and royal residences, and a major cultural hub. The next king, Amenhotep IV, known to us as Akhenaten, ushered many major changes. Akhenaten is often portrayed as a pioneer of monotheism, for he elevated the entity known as the Sun Disk of Ra, or Aten, as the ultimate patron deity of Egypt. However, textual evidence suggests that deities like Horus, Ra, and Thoth continued to be worshipped, making Amenhotep IV not a monotheistic ruler, but a monolatric one, worshipping one deity while accepting others. Amenhotep IV's visions of religious reform centered on the building of a new city called Akhenaten or Amarna, which he dedicated to his patron god Aten. Amarna was a splendorous citadel replete with imagery of various motifs such as feasts, war, or even mourning which all served to emphasize the pharaoh and his grandeur. Akhenaten erased his old name and that of his father from inscriptions, as Amenhotep means Amun is pleased, and was the name of the disfavored deity, and targeted a few deities he deemed unfavorable to him, like the by now popular Amun and his wife Mut. This occurred most likely as a means of curtailing the powerful Amun priest bureaucracy but other scholars consider genuine religious conviction to be the driving factor. His wife, Nefertiti, also patronized multiple temples, like a sun temple in Tel El Amarna, full of beautiful gardens. Afterwards, a short reign by the mysterious Smenkare occurred, but we know very little about their true identity. In the north, raids attacked the northern provinces, and by the time of Akhenaten's possible son, Tutankhaten, later to be named Tutankhamun when the cult of Amun was restored, Egypt began to lose its northern territories. Tutankhamun seems to have reversed his father's reforms, 
possibly under the tutelage of pro-Amun courtly and priestly factions, but died at 19 years old and was buried in a tomb not meant for him, but one that made him famous. After another short reign by a pharaoh called A, the last king of the 18th dynasty, called Haremheb, ruled and reinstated many of the previously persecuted cults by taking down Aten's temples. Haremheb died without children, and appointed his grand vizier in his place. That man was Ramses I, whose reign was very short, lasting only between 1292 to 1290 BCE. His successor was Seti I, a man who reigned for two decades. Seti's main achievements include reasserting himself in the conflict with the ascendant Hittite Empire. He captured Kadesh and the surrounding regions, only to negotiate a peace treaty with the Hittites. On the home front, he undid much of the religious reforms implemented by Akhenaten, investing into the cults which Akhenaten had disfavoured. While his eldest unnamed son was initially to take the throne after him, a younger son managed via courtly intrigue to succeed him. That man was one of Egypt's most famous pharaohs, Ramesses II, whose pronomen, Usamatre, is perhaps the origin of his Greek name, Osimandius. Ramses II ruled from 1279 to 1213 BCE, and, like Austin Powers, had multiple named wives. Ramses is known for endless campaigns in Syria. His first Syrian campaign took place mostly on the Phoenician coast, and was primarily an expeditionary affair, but for his second one, the Hittites were waiting for him. It was then that the Battle of Kadesh took place, one of the oldest recorded battles in human history, which we covered in a previous video. Ramesses' third campaign was more successful. It began when the Hittites, who now had a sphere of influence in Syria, goaded Canaanite locals to revolt against the pharaohs. Ramesses struck back by reinvading Syria and gaining a foothold in the region. After a few more campaigns, he settled on a peace treaty with the Hittite king Mercy III, and then continued fighting in Nubia and even Libya. In terms of domestic policy, Pharaoh Ramesses lavishly invested in temples in Karnak, with beautiful sacred lakes and gardens, and held more said or jubilee festivals than any other pharaoh before him. His funds were graciously donated to temples like Amun's, which received gold from the Nubian viceroy. Ramesses also set up a capital city called P. Ramesses in the Delta, showing how the balance of power in the country was shifting. At his death in old age, he was buried in the famous Ramesseum. Egypt's culture and society developed in many interesting ways during the New Kingdom. In terms of gender relations, women were subordinate to men, and even when they could assert themselves, they had to do so in male-coded ways, such as the statues of the female king had Shepset having a beard. However, women in the New Kingdom enjoyed more privileges than women in other contemporary cultures. For example, they were well studied and had the right to own property, unlike Mesopotamian women. Poetry flourished during this epoch, with famous works being published, such as The Tale of Two Brothers, a story where one sibling tries to resurrect his other sibling. Deir al Medina, a famous state sponsored site for royal artisans, has a massive corpus of texts from aneromancy to village bucolic life to even animal fables. These fables are often accompanied with pictographs, showing delightful imagery such as mice working as bakers or smoking pipes. Love poetry, exclusively written by men, is also present, and highly sophisticated, as the papyrus Chester Beatty shows us. My heart beats rapidly when I think of my love for you. It does not allow me to act sensibly, but jumps from its place. Dedications to deities are present as a large corpus, such as in Karnak where priests brag about their links to the pharaohs, and artisans praise deities, showing the temple economies were particularly flourishing during this period. Other forms of art, such as the ostraca found in Deir el Medina, show us glimpses of everyday people's needs. For instance, a particular motif shows noble women and children in a room with musical instruments and dance playing. Whether these show us elite lifestyles, aspirations of locals, or idealized visuals is hard to say. We often have images of the protector of children, the dwarf god Bess. Ritual imagery often had themes of women's sexuality, 
such as the sky goddess Nut appearing in nude form, or ritual imagery showing the love goddess Hathor. This was a means of showing fertility. Religion developed extensively during this period, as we have seen from the shifts towards the Theban triad, and animal worship expanded in size, and with it animal mummification commissions as ritual offerings in temples. Other deities, like Osiris in Abydos, were also patronized, and of course Ra maintained his primacy, eventually becoming Amun-Ra. Religious texts developed over centuries were completed in this period, such as the Book of Coming Forth by Day or the Egyptian Book of the Dead. The Aten experiment undergone by Akhenaten is interesting in and of itself, with hymns like that of Akhenaten's Hymn to the Aten showing us a bold new way of pharaohs interacting with the divine. Thou appearest beautifully on the horizon of heaven, thou living Aton, the beginning of life. When thou art risen on the eastern horizon, thou hast filled every land with thy beauty. Thou art gracious, great, glistening and high over every land. Thy rays encompass the lands to the limit of all that thou hast made. As thou art re, thou reachest to the end of them. Thou subduest them for thy beloved son. Though thou art far away, thy rays are on earth. Though thou art in their faces, no one knows thy going. All of this cultural development, from art to poetry, was built on scribal bureaucracies, managing wealth from abroad in Libya, Nubia and Palestine. Let us examine Egyptian colonialism in Nubia to see how this unfolded. Paintings from burial sites help us understand how local elites, who were hostages in Egypt, experienced this process. Inscriptions of processions, both presented in painting and described in writing, depicted the very stylized imagery of the Nubians in processions. Further correlations in the archaeology are seen in the presence of Shabtis and other Egyptian customs in the tombs of the urban Nubian elites. We can also find specific Nubian customs, such as oxen findings. This intriguing case suggests a sort of cultural entanglement of the Egyptian and Nubian customs, with the elites being neither fully Egyptian nor fully Nubian. These relations are often forgotten, even in Egyptology itself, due to a large bias towards Egyptian scribal perspectives, themselves prone to politics and elite contempt for their subjects. The peak of the Egyptian empire under Ramesses II was not to last. The inaugurator of the 20th dynasty, Setnakt, only reigned for three years, from 1186 to 1183 BCE. His successor, Ramesses III, was the last great pharaoh of this kingdom. Famines and troubles in Syria led to instability during his reign, something that a certain group of pirates called the Sea Peoples sought to exploit. To the west, in the land of Set, the Libyans were also ready to exert their influence on Egypt. Jointly, the two groups began to conduct raids, a reign of terror Ramesses III was indignant about. As such, his tenure was filled with warfare, with Papiri mentioning his victory and the settlement of the now subject Sea Peoples in southern Canaan. This was to begin Egypt's economic troubles. In an event that would make Pyotr Kropotkin and Karl Marx smile, it was he who faced the first recorded labor strike in history in Deir el Medina in 1128 BCE. This was due to delays in wages and rations, making the artisans indignant. As such, they began a strike and managed to negotiate the rations distribution. This story teaches us that class struggle is a universal pattern in history, even in Egypt under the pharaohs. Ramesses III also faced a plot brewing among the women of his wife's harem, which succeeded in killing him, but failed in putting the favored son, Pentaweret, on the throne. Ramesses IV, who succeeded in the end, was a relatively successful, if mediocre, king. Ramesses V ruled only for three years, and afterwards, Ramesses VI, VII, and VIII ruled in obscure but difficult circumstances. By the time of Ramesses IX, Thebes was far less powerful than before, and a schism between the priests of Amun and the royal throne was to create significant domestic instability, while the provinces on the periphery of the empire were growing ever more free. We know next to nothing of Ramesses X, and the last pharaoh of this dynasty, Ramesses XI, is only known through a sparse handful of inscriptions. He was the last pharaoh before the 21st dynasty. 
Thus, the new kingdom had ended, and the start of the Third Intermediate Period began, not with a bang, but with a whimper. And thus, the sun set in the west, and Ra, alongside Aten, began his trip through the underworld. Ra would dutifully rise for more journeys across the sky, and would see his former domain become increasingly different, while Aten would reminisce about the day he was king. The land of Kemet would see new rulers, many local and later foreign, but all would rule in the shadow of the state forged in the new kingdom, which reunified the country. The temples of the Egyptian gods would gain new divine neighbours as polytheist, Christian, Jewish, Muslim, Hermetic and Gnostic faithful built their shrines, all in the shadow of statues of Ramesses and using Egyptian writings. The new kingdom was gone, but the god Ra would never weep, for Egypt would remain Egypt, its great civilization as seminal as Greece, India, China and Persia's. We may see this period as alien to us, and many will, in an orientalist fashion, deny continuity between the Egyptians of then and now. But the new kingdom's endless wealth and its great innovations in literature, religion and science set the stage for later Egyptian history, as constant as Ra's journey of night and day. More videos on ancient history are on the way. To ensure you don't miss them, make sure you are subscribed and press the bell button. Please consider liking, subscribing, commenting and sharing, it helps immensely. Recently we have started releasing weekly patron and YouTube member exclusive content. Consider joining their ranks via the link in the description or button under the video to watch these weekly videos, learn about our schedule, get early access to our videos, access our private discord and much more. This is the Kings and Generals channel and we will catch you on the next one.